bring in longtime Congressman Charlie Rangel. Congressman, it's good to good see to you see as you. always. The first black president, and he's getting questions about diversity. Are these questions fair? Are you concerned? Of course I'm concerned, and the questions are fair, and, uh, are fair, and the record does speak for itself. I wonder well, whether or not... Well, if the record speaks for itself, what does it say going into this second term? It's embarrassing as hell. Uh, we, we've been through all this with Mitt Romney, and uh, we were very hard on Mitt Romney with his women bind and a variety of things. And I, I kind of think there's no excuse when it's the second term. If it's the first term, you can say people got to know who is around that's qualified in order to get this job, number one. I had thought, and maybe it's so, that it could be the Harvard problem where people just know each other, trust each other, and women and minorities don't get a chance to rub elbows and, and their reputations and experience is not known. But whatever it is, when you do have minorities who understand the problem, as Colin Powell oft times spoken out, is people not knowing the talent that women and minorities have. And if you don't know it, then you don't use it. So he's had four years to work the bench, to work the second team, so that in the second term, uh, these people should be just as experienced as anybody, any other American. You heard what the White House is saying about this, that if you look at other high-level positions, not necessarily cabinet positions, that he has appointed a lot of women, a lot of minorities. But is it important from your perspective that these positions that women, minorities get appointed to are visible, the most highly visible? We know that state, defense, treasury, as Ruth Marcus points out, are kind of the big boy jobs. Please, let's make it clear. It's not the individual that gets these prestigious jobs that we're talking about. We're talking about American kids being able to look and aspire and the hope that one day... You know, there is no way to substitute having an African-American president where kids now, no matter what the economic or social circumstances are, their parents could tell them if they can get the money, if they can raise a couple of billion dollars, that they could become president. And so the whole idea with women is when mothers are raising their kids, and they tell them that in this great country of ours, you can make it. Uh, that is far more important than the individual that has succeeded. And I think Hillary Clinton has really done more to shatter this whole idea that not only is a question of fairness, but what is good for America as she uh, assumed that role of Secretary of State. And so you have to do these things because it, it, it's the right thing to do as a symbol of what America stands for. And that's whether you're Republican or Democrat. That is one of the major problems that Republicans have. They just don't get where America is going. Let me bring our women back in. And Nia Malika, uh, besides the change that, that we're looking at in terms of diversity, there's also been a lot of talk about this whole idea, uh, maybe it's you know, Oscar nomination day, about team of rivals, which seems so important. And now a lot of people are suggesting that what the president has this time, Chris Saliza wrote this, is that it's more like a team of allies. And given where we are in Washington and how divided it is, is that a problem as well? Well, you know, I think that certainly uh, was the idea behind the first administration, that first cabinet, this whole team of rivals idea. But there was also a, a sense, I think, in those early days that it was still a very insular crowd uh, that the White House had. A lot of folks from Chicago, a lot of uh, the, the president's friends that he, he had known uh, coming up in, in Washington for the years that he was here. So, and I, I think that's the case now as well. And, you know, obviously he's going into the second term. It's going to be a tough road uh, to hoe going forward around some of these really tough issues, whether it's gun control or whether it's budget negotiations. Uh, and so people who have been in Washington for years tend to stay in Washington for years. They're the ones who are in the pipelines and they're the ones uh, who get the jobs. All right, let me switch gears a little bit because there's another big story going on in Washington today, and that is this meeting between Joe Biden and, and among others, the NRA. And, and Congressman, um, this meeting also with Hollywood, the video game industry, how important is it? It's so important. I, I never once thought that uh, the churches and the synagogues and the American people were prepared to take on the NRA. They are so unbelievably uh, powerful on the Hill. But now with the president bringing in the swinging Joe Biden, uh, with uh, so many, uh, with, with Bloomberg just waiting to get up at bat to not... And your friend, Governor Cuomo, did you hear him yesterday? Exactly. In fact, we've got a clip. Let me play a little bit from his State of the State address yesterday. I say to you, forget the extremists. It's simple. 
No one hunts with an assault rifle. No one needs 10 bullets to kill a deer. And too many innocent people have died already. There are two perspectives on statements like that. One is that it's very important for somebody who's high profile to get out there to set the example. The other is he's a liberal Democrat. He's in a state that already has tough gun control laws, and essentially it really doesn't mean that much. What do you think? I think common sense will prevail. Uh, people who love hunters and love to hunt, this has nothing to do with protecting their rights to do just that. We have too many guns, too many people are dying, and, and it's a civilized country. It is the worst example we can set for the rest of the world. And so I'm proud of my governor, I'm proud of my mayor, and I'm so proud of Joe Biden. When he sits at the table, he means business. And so I really think for the first time since I've been in Washington that we're on the right road and we've got to do something this time. Uh, Connecticut's governor, Dan Malloy, is one of the elected leaders that was actually talking to Vice President Biden yesterday. Let me play for you what he said this morning. He's got this down pretty well. He understands what we need to do to, to, to make it less likely that these things are going to happen in our, in our cities and towns uh, and these mass murders uh, uh, could be limited at least going into the future if some common sense uh, things are taken. The magazine thing is very big. His top two limit magazines and closed gun show, show loopholes. Uh, take us on the hill here. Take us inside the White House, Shira. What are the chances that this stuff gets done? It's very, very difficult. I mean, look, if there was an ever an opportunity for Congress to pass some kind of gun control measures, I think this is it. But the road to doing that is still very complicated. You have Democrats controlling the Senate, but many of those are fairly conservative Democrats uh, who have been supported by the NRA in the past. And then you have the House, which is obviously uh, run by Republican, uh, controlled by Republicans, many of whom are very conservative. It's a really difficult path to pass this legislation. That's why it was interesting to hear Joe Biden mention uh, the executive order issue and whether he might use that. Would you suggest that the president do that, Congressman? I it's want easy. him to do everything that he can, and I want to say this to the church. If they can give this much uh, authority and support against the same-sex marriages, if they can just substitute gun control there just for a little bit of the time, it won't be the Congress. It will be the American people that can and will do this if it's presented to them in a common-sense way. I just hope, you know, a human life, whether, whether it's in Newtown or whether it's in Chicago or New York, the churches and the synagogues' silence on this issue has been deafening. Now America, the door is open for America. America to come forward, and I'm confident the Congress will respond. Congressman Charles Rangel, always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. Nia Malika Henderson, Shira Toplitz, thanks to you.